lot of got a lot of points to make in this chapter. There's kind of a lot of topics covered in Proverbs 11. That's going to be the way it is going most of the way through the rest of the the book now. But um, so let's dig right in here. Proverbs chapter 11, verse number one. By the way, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And I'm going to dig into this a little bit more in the future. This is the first time this concept has come up in the book of Proverbs. So it's not going to be the last time. But basically what he's saying is, you know, a balance is used to, to measure things out. Is, you know, and typically... Um, Oftentimes in trade and in dealings, if you're if you're balancing out, you know when you when you're buying things, you use a scale. You know you still do this at the grocery store when you you buy fruits and vegetables and things like that. You put it on a scale and a just bal a false balance. It says here is abomination. So one that's rigged, one that's designed to give you a false reading. And someone who does that is someone who's going to be trying to cheat, trying to steal, right? So if you go to the store, if someone's operating a store. Well, they're always going to want their scale to be heavy, right? Because that means you're going to have to pay them that much more for whatever it is that you're buying. And the Bible says that that's an abomination to the Lord when you do underhanded things like that and you try to steal from people and, you know, and, and deceive them by using a false balance. It says, but a just weight is his delight. So that's what that's referring to there. Again, I'm going to get into that a lot more detail in, in, the, in the future chapters. But um, let's continue on here. Verse number two, the Bible says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. And any time, you know, when you feel yourself start to be getting proud and no one can tell you anything, you can't be taught, you know, just realize that shame is going to come. You know, you will be brought down. God will abase those that are lifted up in pride. And it's better to recognize that before you have to be brought to shame and, and, and be brought down to be ashamed. But he says, with the lowly is wisdom. And wise are wisdom with the lowly because you're, you're wise to not let yourself get lifted up in pride and have that shame come down to you. Verse number three, the integrity of the upright shall guide them and the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. I'm going to spend a little bit of time now on this, on this topic here and just this word integrity. This is something that seems to be lacking by and large, for especially as the younger generation keeps coming up, this word integrity, I think many people don't even know what it means anymore. And I think this is such a, it should be such a core value that should be instilled in our children and in ourselves, this idea of integrity. It's so crucial to the way that you live your life. I mean, it, it, it defines who you are as a person. If you have integrity, it is an extremely valuable um, characteristic to have. The dictionary definition of integrity, because I, I, I know what it means, but this is a very, I think this is a very good applicable definition. The, uh, the, the, the dictionary that I referred to says, integrity is adherence to moral and ethical principles, soundness of moral character and honesty. I think that's a great definition. Somebody who is, who is sound in their morality. They have principles. The principles is what guides their life. It's not just what the world says. It's not just what feels good at a time. It's someone who has integrity is someone who has principles. And we ought to have integrity and principles that we have gained from God's word where we can make decisions not just based on what's going to financially benefit me on a given day, not on what's going to feel good at a particular time, but on what is right and what is wrong. When somebody can, can in the face of all opposition, be able to stand their ground and say, no, this is what's right. I don't care if everybody's doing what's wrong. I don't care if this is popular now. I'm going to stand here even if it means all by myself. That is somebody with integrity. That is somebody who can say, I believe in something greater. I believe in God's word. I believe in the truth. And be able to make their decisions and guide their life based on that integrity. A great example of this, turn it if you would to the book of Job. Job is an excellent example of a man that lived his life by integrity. By someone who had convictions, who had a foundation and a firm belief in what he believed and in God's word, and he lived by it. And he didn't let his circumstances dictate how he was going to act and how he was going to respond and what he was going to do and if he was going to change his mind and curse God because of all the, the horrible things that happened in his life. 
The integrity that he lived by prevented him from doing that. And in look, having integrity is not easy. That is why it's such a valuable characteristic to have. Because the easy thing to do is just to give up. The easy thing to do is just to be a pushover. The easy, easy thing to do is to, is to change what you believe based on whatever people are telling you or whatever opposition you're facing. Look at Job chapter 2, verse number 3. This is one of the things that God commends Job about is his integrity. Because you know in Job chapter 1, of course, you know, God's talking about Job, you know, when Satan comes, presents himself with the sons of God, and he says, you know, hey, have you seen my servant Job? There's not a man like him in all the earth. You know, he fears God. He does it, you know, and Satan, you know, is telling God, oh, yeah, well, he's just doing this because you built a hedge about him and you protected him and all this other stuff, right? So God allows the attack from Satan to go forward where Satan basically takes all of his wealth, all of his finances, his children and everything. And you know the story of Job. That happens in chapter 1. And now here we are in chapter 2. Satan goes and he's, and he's standing before God again. And look what God says in verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. He's saying even after everything you've done, He's still holding on to his integrity. He still is a man of his word. He still is a man that's living by the principles of the Bible. Yeah, sure, he was living by the principles of the Bible and everything was going great for him and everything was just fine. But now that everything has just turned for the worse and gone completely bad, you know what? He's still standing for the word and for the truth and for what's right. He retained his integrity. In verse number 9, we see his wife even say unto him, you know, dost thou still retain thine integrity, curse God and die. So the way that he would lose his integrity would be by blaming God, cursing God, getting angry at God for all that has gone wrong in his life. But no, he didn't do that. Instead, he, you know, he tells her, what, are you one of the foolish women? You know, speak like the foolish women speak. I'm not going to curse God for this. And he knows. I mean, all throughout the chapter, you can see, you know, there's, through the book, I mean, not just a chapter. He doesn't understand why things are going the way they are because he knows he's not in any big sin. He knows he shouldn't be going through this type of punishment just, you know, for, for what he's been doing because he, he was an upright man. But at no point did he foolishly charge God. He kept his integrity. And even after the end of chapter 2, when he lost his health because he lost all of his other stuff, but then when Satan touched him and he you know, had all his boils and sores and he was just literally in misery and in pain and anguish from, from, the, from the disease that he was afflicted with, he still did not charge foolishly or sin with his lips, the Bible says. And that is a man that has integrity. Job said in, in chapter 27 in verse 5, he says, God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove mine integrity from me. We all ought to have an attitude like Job had. Until the day I die, you will not take my integrity from me. I am going to stand. I am going to be a man of my word until the day that I die. And that's part of the honesty, part of the, of the definition of integrity too. You know, when you say, I'm a man of my word. You know, people who just lie about things, that is zero integrity. And that seems to be more and more common these days. I don't know about you, but I have noticed it personally, like in the business world and other aspects, like just dealing with people in general. We're not so far removed from a culture and a people in this country that had a lot more respect for the things that were said, where people wouldn't just shoot off their mouth and say things, you know, emotionally and just, and I know people have always done this throughout time, but I mean in general, you know, there's, there's, there's standards set within a society, there's manners, there's, you know, culture, people, the way people present themselves. And men used to be men of their word and it actually meant something really important to them that if you're going to say something, then you're going to do it. And if you're not sure, then you better not even say anything about it. These days, people are running their mouth over everything. Yeah. 
You see it happening all the time. The most reason I see on Facebook, guys saying like, oh yeah, you come over here and I'll show you, I'll give you a whoop and all this other stuff. It's like, you know, people get real tough behind the keyboard on the internet and stuff and it's like, you're not a man of your word. You have no integrity because 99.9% .9 of these people that say things like that, when you actually are face to face with them, won't do anything. Yeah because they're cowards, because they could be real tough behind, you know, sitting in their comfortable room or in their office and typing away or whatever. But you ought to be careful with the things that you say. You ought to be true to your word. And, you know, the Bible puts big emphasis. I preached an entire sermon about this, about being a man of your word, because God's word puts emphasis on, the, the, you know, being true to your word and being true to the things that you say. And the Bible says, hey, look, don't swear at all, because what's swearing? You're making an oath. You're saying, I am saying this, and I'm going to do this. The Bible recommends don't swear at all. He says, neither by heaven nor by earth, you know, because God expects you to keep your word Think about how, how, much God, how much God emphasizes his own word. Jesus Christ is the word. He's the word made flesh. God's word is inerrant. It is perfect. It is without flaw. God cannot contradict his own word. God does not go back on his word. By God's word, we are saved. Amen. That is how important God's word is to him. He cannot, he has to be faithful. He cannot go back on his word. That's why we know we have eternal life. That's why we know we can't lose our salvation. Because if God has said it, then we know it's true. Amen. We know it's true. There is no doubt in our mind. But how about you? When you say something, can people just know, yes, that's true. Yes, that man is speaking the truth. Yes, that lady, when she says she's going to do something, she's going to do it. Because that's what having integrity means. When you have that value set, when you say, you know what, to the day I die, I am not going to budge. I am not going to lose my integrity. Psalm 7, verse 8, the Bible reads, you don't have to turn, or you turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Proverbs 19. Psalm 7, verse 8 says, the Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. So here we see the psalmist going, you know, talking to God and saying, God, judge me according to my integrity. Hopefully you can say the same thing and look at God and say, God, I have integrity. You could judge me according to my own integrity. Psalm 26 verse 1 says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. We ought to have the integrity to do what's right, to have the principles form, the foundation, the truth of God's word defining the things that we do, the way that we live, the way that we walk. Everything is built upon these principles, and if you can do that, you have integrity. You're not letting any other factors determine what makes your decision-making for you. It's this book. It's God's Word. Proverbs 19, look at verse number 1. Proverbs 19, verse 1 reads, Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. You say, you know what? It's way better for you to even just be poor. You would have nothing but still have your integrity. You know, we saw earlier the, the just weight and the just balance. You can say, yeah, but I can make so much more money and I'll have all this more wealth and I'll be so much better off and I'll be so much happier and all, you know, everything else is going to work out for me. No, it won't. It's better for you just to be poor and do it the right way. Be honest. Be a man of your word. Have integrity than to cut the corners and, and be shady and, and be dishonest just for the, the short-term gain because that's all it is is short-term game. And I'm preaching here to a room full of believers, and you know what? You're not going to lose your salvation if you cut the corners and if you're shady in your dealings and your business and things like that, but the Bible states that you're going to reap what you sow. So we all ought to be careful with how, you know, with the way that we live our life. You know, yeah, you, you'll still go to heaven. Jesus paid for all that. But when you live your life, you know, you better be dealing honesty, honestly, because for one, if you get found out, or I shouldn't say if, when you get found out, when these things come to light, you are just going to be bringing a reproach upon the name of Jesus Christ. 
People say, oh, well, that's a Christian. Well, how is he different than anybody else? He's out there cheating. He's out there deceiving. He's got a false balance. We ought to be people of integrity. You know, and you know what? If that means you've got to be poor in order to retain your integrity, then be poor. Amen. Because the money doesn't matter nearly anywhere close as much as your word and your integrity. And that you could have. You could keep that pure. Verse, uh, Proverbs 20. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 7. It's the last place we'll look on this uh, topic of just retaining your integrity. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. We ought to be, especially as parents, role models, examples of integrity. Your children will be blessed when they can look at you as, the, as their prime example, as someone that they're looking to day in and day out as you're raising them. When you tell them something, do you follow through on it? And you know what? This will test you every day of your life as a parent, especially when your kids are young. You make promises unto them. You know, I, I try my hardest. If I'm going to say something to one of my children, that I mean what I say. And I'm not perfect in this area. But it is extremely important when you're going to say you're going to do something or not going to do something that you stick by it. And honestly, parents, this is going to only give you respect from your children when you stick to your words. Because I don't care how bad you may feel. Maybe you say they're not going to have something. You punish them. You take something away from them. And you say, you're not going to get this. As I do with my children, I said, you're not getting these devices back for the whole summer. The little iPods or whatever. Now, I can look at it and say, oh, man, you know, that was so long ago now. It's already been a couple months. You know, maybe I should just give it back to them. No, I shouldn't. Because what you won't want to do is start this pattern of, well, Dad said this, but then we got it back anyways. Well, Dad said this. Well, he doesn't really mean that because he never seems to stick by his word. And it gets to the point to where, well, how are they going to believe anything that you say? You have to be able to stick by the things that you say. And if you say you're going to do something nice for them, you know, do something nice for them. Then don't, don't make them think like, oh, yeah, there's another one of those promises again. And it's sad. I know many people who grew up in households where they had a mother or a father, especially in split homes, and dad is, you know, they're living with mom, and dad, I'm going to come, and I'm going to get you, and we're going to do this. And it's just a failure every time and it's just a major disappointment and there's no more respect for that person anymore and it just ruins their you know the whole relationship as opposed to just being someone of integrity and being able to to do the things that you say and it says you know your children will be blessed with you having that integrity so it says the just man walketh in his integrity his children are blessed after him your children will be blessed by you making the decision to do the things that you say, to, to make decisions on principle so that people can... And your children should always be able to know, you know or learn what decision you're going to make about things. That's the best way to teach them, when you teach them the principles. See, it's one thing, you could have all the right rules. But if all they see is the rules... They're never really going to understand and learn why you even have those rules. They need to learn the principles. They need to learn the reasoning behind the rules. That will last with them then as they get older and especially as they get out from underneath your roof and they go off on their own ways when they know the principles. And you ought to be making the decision so that if they ever wanted to say, I wonder what mom or dad would think about this. Well, if they know what you stand for, if they know what your principles are, if they know that the rules that you're making are all based on God's Word, they can say, well, they would say this because that's what the Bible says. And it shouldn't be a mystery to them. And you know what? They'll be blessed by having that knowledge and having that wisdom. Let's go back, if we would, to Proverbs chapter 11. Integrity is so important, it's being lost and wasted and people are ruining their name, ruining their reputation, ruining the chance to even be someone that has integrity because of all the lies and because of, you know, not being founded and grounded in God's word. Let's keep reading here in Proverbs 11. Look at verse number 4. The Bible reads, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. 
Now, again, we've seen a couple of mentions to this, um, you know, this idea of the, you know, the false balance and trusting in money. And this is a common theme throughout Proverbs also of just, you know, what are you focused on? Is it money or is it on the actual important things? Proverbs is always going to continue to give you what is important. There's all these other things that are not that important. You know, what's important? Having integrity. What's important? Being honest. What's important? Being lowly, not being proud. In these first four verses, you can see how they, they go together. And when I read this verse, especially when I was preparing for this, riches profit not in the day of wrath, I immediately thought of Revelation chapter 6. So if you go to Revelation chapter 6. Where is your trust ultimately? Where, where, where do you derive your strength from? Where do you turn to? When problems arise, I hope it's not your riches if you have wealth. Because riches will profit not in the day of wrath. And what, a, what bigger day of wrath is there than in Revelation chapter 6 when Jesus Christ comes back? Look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible reads, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men. So these are all the, the rich and powerful people, right, of the earth at that time. It says, and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? The people that, the, the rich and the greaty and the mighty and the kings, you know, they have all this wealth and all this power and that's what they're trusting in to help them in their time of trouble. It's going to help them not at all. It doesn't matter what arsenal they have. It doesn't matter what bunker they've built. It doesn't matter what mountain they've dug into and they've got their doomsday bunker all planned out for them. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, they're going to be running and hiding and saying, fall on us, you'll hide us. We don't even want to see him. But guess what? They can't hide. You can't hide from that wrath. It's going to do you no good. No good. Now, look, I'm not saying, like, if you want to be prepared for things, you know, whatever, I don't care. You know, I'm not. But what are you trusting in? And ultimately, there, you know, and I, I don't want to take that back completely, but what are you trusting in? Where is your primary trust? Now, I'm not going to say it's a sin to have some form of, like, prepper, pre preparedness for, for bad times or for, you know, something to go wrong here or whatever. You could have wisdom in being prepared for things, but what are you truly trusting in at the end of the day? Your trust ought to be first and foremost in the Lord and in God to, to, to save you and um, not to, to just trust in your riches and in the things that you have in this world. Like for example, you know, I, uh, I own guns. I own firearms because I think that it's prudent and I think it's wise to be able to defend myself or to defend my family from an intruder, from an invader. But you know what? Ultimately, I know and I know for a fact that I'm going to be trusting completely in God. I mean, I have these things. I have these tools. I think we should be, you know, as, as um, reasonable as possible and, and as uh, wise as possible to do as much as we can physically. But at the end of the day, my trust is in the Lord. And if I'm going, you know, whether, whether, I, whether I'm armed or not, my, my faith is going to be in God. I'll do what I can do to try to, to try to, you know, keep myself alive and to protect my family. But it doesn't mean anything if God's not with me. I could have all the guns in the world. I could have the biggest arsenal you've ever seen. And if God's not with me, pff, right. I'm not going to trust those, those odds against anyone. I mean, it, does, it, it, it means nothing. The Bible says in, in Psalm 27, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but he will re we will remember the name of the Lord our God. There's nothing wrong with having the chariots and horses, but that's not going to be my trust. That's not going to be my stay. That's not going to be where I'm deriving my, um, you know, my strength from. It's going to be from God. And I think that we ought to have 
you know, that, that's, that's biblical to have that, um, that attitude where riches do not profit in the day of wrath. Let's look at, are you, are you still in Proverbs? Proverbs 11, we're going to keep reading here. Verse number 5. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son. Oh, excuse me, that was chapter 10. Chapter 11. I'm like, wait a minute, that looks familiar. I already preached on that. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. But the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. And that's another common theme too. You know, we see this throughout, the, throughout Proverbs, being righteous and, you know, is, is the way to be and being unrighteous is not good. You know, it's good and bad. But what happens is here, it says the transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. You know, people who, who lay traps for others and, and, and look to do wicked and do evil things, they oftentimes will end up being taken in their own devices. And honestly, that's a prayer that I have for these people. You know, when the wicked people come against God's people, when the haters of God are fighting against God, and they're doing all of these, you know, just, just trying to be annoying and, and, and attacking in all these various ways that you hear about, about, you know, these pastors getting all this grief from people. I always just pray, God, bring that upon their own head. They're laying all these traps. They're trying to, to cause all these problems. You know, they're trying to get the, you know, these churches kicked out of their building. You know, bring that back on their own head. You know, these people that try to, are getting, trying to get these churches kicked out of, out of their buildings. You know, would to God that they just got kicked out of their house. And you know what? That's the type of thing that happens. And the Bible talks about that happening. When the wicked get, um, the transgressors are taken in their own naughtiness. It's going to come back around on their own heads, the things that they try to do to other people. Look at uh, verse number 7 there in Proverbs 11. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. So at that day, for the wicked person, the unsaved wicked person, at the day of their death, it says their expectation, what they're expecting, you know, their hopes for the future, what they, what they think is going to happen. He says that all expect, that's all gone. That's going to die with them. And the hope of the unjust men perisheth. Why? Because when they die, they're going to realize there is no more hope for them. Right. They are going to be burning in hell. And it is what it is, and that's you know, and and, and would to God people would uh, would take heed to that, but um, that is just a, a solemn truth that we see here in the book of Proverbs that you know what, when the wicked man dies, that's it. There's no more hope for him, and this also proves you know the the, the concept that once you die, that's it, because there is no more. Hope. If when you die, if you go to hell, you have zero hope. We don't believe in the doctrine of the purgatory. You know, the Catholic doctrine that says, oh, well, you know, you could go to this place and then after a while, after you've been purged, then you get to go to heaven. No. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Because once you die, there is no more hope if you are unsaved. You are not going to just be purged for a while and then come back out. That's it. The expectation perishes. The hope of the unjust man perisheth. It dies. It's gone. Look at verse number 8. The righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. And hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Verse number 10. I'm going to focus on this verse now for a little while. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. Hey, when things are going well, when, when the people who are righteous and godly and doing what's right, and it's going real well for them, hey, the whole city rejoices. Great. Praise God. Things are going great for the people who are actually righteous. And look at this. It says, and when the wicked perish, there is shouting. It's not angrily shouting. That's like, great. The wicked perish. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. They're gone. The wicked haters of God are dead. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 94. We're going to see some more of this truth because in, most recently, this is what has gotten Pastor Jimenez under fire by the world, by the media, and even by some Christians is agreeing 
with Proverbs 11.10 that says, When the wicked perish, there is shouting. And many other scriptures that we're going to look at. Why wouldn't you be glad? When you got people now, and again, you can read, and, and, and as we go through, especially with the book of Proverbs, when it talks about the wicked, when it talks about these people, and, 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 it, and it references either the righteous and the wicked. These are two extremes. On the one hand, the righteous, you've got the saved, you know, washed in the blood believers. And then the wicked, though, the, the people who are all, they're just always described here as being wicked, they're not just your average unsaved person. I mean, these are the people who are wicked, who are, they can't sleep until they've devised some mischief against people, and who really are setting traps and have it out for other people. That's who the Bible is talking about, brothers, when it's talking about the wicked. They're like the sons of Belial that the Bible talks about. These are children of the devil that are, that are bent on just doing bad things to people. And when you have people like that, wouldn't you be happy when they're gone? Because you won't have to worry as much about innocent people being defiled and being you know, caught in their traps and, and them destroying and, and defiling and murdering and killing and doing everything else. That's actually a good thing. That's actually a reason to rejoice. I mean, isn't that the reason why there was so much rejoicing, for example, when Saddam Hussein was taken out of power? Because wasn't he such an evil man that, like, you know, was supposedly doing I mean, I, I don't know that much about him. I mean, that was the story. That's the narrative, right? That's what we were told. Is that, I mean, this guy was horrible, and he was, you know, putting all kinds of people to death and causing all kinds of problems. And what happened to the people over there? They rejoiced, right? Hey, he's out of here, yeah. And they published that, you know, they hung him and, and, and got rid of him, and it was a great celebration. Same thing with Osama bin Laden, right? I mean, the United States was praying, you know, yeah, we got him! They're shouting! And that's fine. And no one, no one, none of the Christians seem to have a problem with that. But when you have the, the sodomite haters of God that perish, and you shout for that, all of a sudden, whoa, 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 wait a minute, you can't do that now. That's not very loving. They're wicked. It's just. It's righteous. Look at Psalm 94, verse number 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. And again, vengeance belongs to God. I'm not saying that we are going out and taking vengeance on people. But when the vengeance comes, there's no reason not to be happy about it. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Verse 2, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. And just think about that. Who's more proud than the Sodomites? Verse number 3, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and all the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Isn't this describing a pretty wicked people? Yeah. Breaking in pieces thy people, afflicting thine heritage, slaying the widow and stranger, murdering the fatherless. Yeah, it's pretty wicked people, right? That's why it says in verse 7, Yet they say the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it, saying they're not going to, uh, they don't care about God. And that's why David, or, you know, in verse 1, there's a call to God to bring vengeance upon this people. The call is there saying, God, show yourself. God, you know, take care of these people. You're the one that, that, that is, is responsible for taking you know, vengeance on people. Where are you, God? These people are doing all this harm and all this damage. God, take care of them. And that's a righteous thing to do. Look at Psalm 58. Go backwards a little bit in your Bible. Psalm 58, verse number 10, the Bible reads, The righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. The vengeance of God, right? Why wouldn't you? Hey, if you're righteous, it says that the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. So that a man shall say, Verily, there is a reward for the righteous. 
Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. Going and washing your feet in the blood of the slain, is that showing any respect for those people at all? No. None. None whatsoever. It's saying, you know what? I am, so, I am glad that you're gone. I am glad that you're dead. And I'm going to wash my feet in your blood because you're wicked. You're wicked as hell and you deserve to die. It's the same type of people that are going out and being murderous and, and, and you know, afflicting God's people and, and hating God. This isn't, again, I can't be more clear. This isn't your average unsaved person. See, people kind of want to want to mix it all together and say, well, you're just super hateful and you just want every sinner to be killed and wash your feet in their blood. No, that's not what we're teaching at all. It's the extremely wicked people that hate God, the reprobates, that this is talking about. I mean, you got to, again, you got to do something with these verses. What are you going to do with it when the Bible says the righteous shall rejoice? Not the, the, not the people walking in their flesh and have hate in their hearts are going to rejoice when they see the vengeance of God. No, that's not what it says. It says the righteous. The righteous shall rejoice. Psalm 68. Flip over to Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. And again, you're going to see the same concept coming up of people hating God. These are the enemies of God. And these are the people who it's righteous to see the vengeance come upon. The haters of God. Verse 2. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. But that's not loving. No, it's not loving. Of course not. But it's, it's a righteous indignation against the wicked haters of God that is taught from the Bible. And I know these days it sounds extreme. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 6. I know it sounds extreme because of the mass brainwashing of, of what Christianity even is. We can't get lopsided in any of our views. It's got to be complete. It's got to be perfect from, the, from Scripture. Now look, do we love our neighbors ourselves? Yes. Do we go out and preach the gospel? Do we love the lost? Yes. Do we help people? Do we give alms? Do we do whatever we can to help at large the community, the people, anyone around us, anyone that we can and need? Yes. But when it comes to the wicked, when it comes to the reverie, when it comes to the people that hate God... No. No, we actually want God's vengeance upon them. And what drives me nuts is people say, well, how could you even know? You can't know who's reprobate or anything. You could never know. Only God knows. Then who was David, you know, bringing vengeance upon? How did he know who these people were, but we can't know who they are because only God knows the heart? No, because God has given us all of the attributes and qualities of these people that hate God. Right. It's not that hard to discern, my friends. Right. It's only hard to discern when you have a soft spot for the haters of God. And you're only going to bring wrath upon yourself when you love them that hate the Lord, just like King Jehoshaphat was told by the prophet when he helped those and loved those that hated the Lord. When he helped the wicked King Ahab. Revelation chapter 6, look at verse number 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This is talking about the martyrs that are being killed during the tribulation. The people who are preaching Jesus Christ and they're being put to death. And they're seen in heaven under the altar, the souls of them that were slain, verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? 
But God, we've just been killed. We're being slaughtered down there. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? These, these martyrs are calling out to God and saying, God, we avenge us. Bring justice on these people. They're not saying, God, forgive them. They're saying, God, avenge us. Avenge us. Bring justice to those wicked people. Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. These are souls of people in heaven. Do you think that they're just in the flesh when they're saying, Avenge them, O Lord? Uh, they don't have any flesh. Their flesh is down on the earth. They're up in heaven. The sinful flesh is gone. They don't have that anymore. So what's all that's left? Their soul and their spirit. Are they sinning in heaven before God? Because I don't think so. They got white robes. How are they going to be sinning? It's righteous. That's why their indignation and in calling on God to bring judgment is righteous. They're not bringing the judgment themselves. At no point do we see that. At every single reference here in the book of Psalms, it's calling on God. God, bring justice. God, bring your vengeance. And when God brings vengeance, there's no reason not to rejoice when the wicked are slain. And that's who got slain in Orlando was a bunch of wicked people. Wicked reprobates. Which is why I am not one little bit ashamed of what any of my friends have said publicly and have gotten attacked for. Amen. Not one bit. Why? Not because they're my friends. Not because I'm just trying to show loyalty to them as a friend or as a person. Because they're speaking the truth from the Word of God. That's why. Because it's righteous. Because what they said is right and is true and is biblical. Amen. That's why. <clears throat> Let's go back to Proverbs 11. It is shocking though today, and I understand that. It's shocking for people to hear that. Why? Because it hasn't been said for so long. And when parts of the Bible get forgotten... They get skipped over. They don't get preached. They don't get read. I mean, how many Christians out there today are even reading their Bible cover to cover? It can be a shock. When you're, when you're listening to the world's music, when you're watching the world's movies, when you're reading the world's media, their, their newspapers and everything else, when you hear this part of God's Word, it's shocking. But you have to ask yourself, what does the Bible say? Because that is what matters. That is how you define integrity. Are you making decisions? Are you, are you living your life based on what this word says? Or what the world says is what's popular? If you're a man of integrity, you're going to stick to the principles of the Bible and not back down in the face of any opposition. Let's keep reading here. Proverbs 11, verse number 11. Don't worry. Those were two of the main points. Of <laughs> we're going to go through with a little bit of faster pace. As you're like, man, we're only on verse 11. Come on, Pastor Burson. <laughs> verse number 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. <clears throat> but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. And the mouth of the wicked can be very um, loud as it is today. And we got to be careful about that. That's why there's some people whose mouths must be stopped because we don't want the city to be overthrown, especially the city that we're in. You know, and thank God we're not at the point where the mouth of the wicked in this town is, 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 I don't think we're in any danger of it being overthrown yet, but that's why you have to always be diligent about it and be on it and the, um, and, and have 
the upright words being exalted and, and expressed and, um, and taught. And that's why it's so important for us to be reaching out as many people as we can and bringing them God's word and bringing them the light so that we don't have the mouth of the wicked that wants to, that's going to get the city overthrown. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit Conceal it the matter. And I've taught on this before, I think even in, in this, in Proverbs. But basically it's saying that, you know, if you have understanding, you're going you're gonna to hold your peace. You're going to refrain from saying things. We need to have that filter on our mouth of, of what ought to be said and what not. And that's why it says a tale bearer revealeth secrets. Someone who likes to just talk and gossip, you know, you can't rely on that person to, to keep anything. So you can't have any trust in that person to tell them something that's personal because they're a talebearer. They reveal secrets. It says, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. If you are a faithful friend, if you have a faithful heart, then you will be able to receive things and not just have to go and tell everybody about it. And there's a lot of things that you can learn about people or people can say, where you can do a lot of damage by spreading, you know, being a tail bearer. But what good is that going to bring that person? You got you to remember, you know, the, the, the main focus of, of, of what your job is. It's not to just be telling lies, or not even telling lies, but telling, you could be telling truth. You say, well, well, it's the truth. Yeah, but there's not always a reason to be telling other people about it. Right. And I'll tell you what, when you get known for doing that, nobody's going to talk to you and you're not going to get any confidence from anybody and you won't, you'll lose your opportunity to even be a good friend to people because you're going to be known as a tail bearer. And again, integrity. Have the integrity to be able to have a relationship with people where you can be confided in and be able to provide counsel to people without them worrying about you going around and just and being a tail bearer about their business. Verse 14, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. It's always a good idea to go and get counsel from a godly source. And I preached an entire sermon about this. I'm not going to spend much time here. But, you know, when there's no counsel, it says the people fall. When there's nobody to guide, nobody to provide some, some wisdom on, on, on topics, you're going to fall. And that's one of the important reasons why we come to church and you, get, you make friendships here and especially with other people that you respect and you say, wow, here's someone who really seems to know their Bible well. I'm going to go to them and be as a counselor to help me in, in my time and that will bring safety. Verse number 15, he that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it and he that hateth suretyship is sure. I've already preached on that. Verse 16, a gracious woman retaineth honor and strong men retain riches. Real interesting verse here. Again, I, I've preached this before. I don't have the time to, to dig into it. But that word honor, I fully believe, is not just talking about respect. There's a, a connotation in the Bible of honor also referring to like financially being supported. When the Bible says honor your father and mother, the, the biggest example of this, the biggest proof or evidence of this to be true is that the Bible's commandments to honor your father and mother in the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said that the Pharisees were making the commandment of God of none effect when they said that it is korban, that is to say a gift by whatsoever that might be profited by me of the Pharisees talking to their father their physical in the flesh father saying, well, it's a gift. However, you might be profited by me, right? Whatever I do for you that, that's bringing profit to you, it's a gift. Just consider, consider yourself lucky that I'm being gracious enough to give you a gift as opposed to it being their duty and responsibility by the word of God to honor their father and mother. And it talks about, you know, um, honor with, the, with honor widows who are widows indeed. And the way you honor them is by the church taking care of them, financially supporting them. It's not just, oh, you, all you have to do, churches, is just respect, res give them respect. No, you, you take care of them with their widows indeed. And it goes through all the qualifications of that also. I'm not going to get into that. But we see here then, a gracious woman, someone who is thankful Someone who is exhibiting a lot of grace, and it says they're going to retain their honor. 
Because let's face it, you know, people don't want to be helping out someone who's proud, someone who's a loudmouth, someone who seem, you know, it makes them seem a lot more undeserving of, of your help when you don't have the proper attitude, when you're not humble, when you're not being gracious and having gratitude and being thankful for what is being given unto you. So in order to retain that honor, you ought to be gracious in the same way a strong man retains riches, right? You, you, you retain, you know, the strong man, you're not being pushed around, you're not, you know, not, people aren't coming through and stealing from you, you're, you're being strong, you're retaining your riches. But I think that that's also another slight indication of the, of, to support my view of the word honor being used in the same context of men retaining riches. Women have been gracious to retain their honor and men being strong to retain their riches. Verse number 17, The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Verse 18, The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil to his own death. They that are of a froward heart are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. And again, I mean, you know, over and over again, we're seeing the wicked versus the righteous, the wicked versus the righteous, and, and how um, you definitely want to be living a righteous life. Verse 21, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. And it doesn't matter how many of the wicked are banded together, they will fall. Right. It doesn't matter how strong they appear to be, how strong they think they are, how much money they have. They, like I said, they have all the weapons in the world, everything else. It says, even when all of the unsaved world is gathered together with Satan leading the charge, right? Though arm be an arm, they, you know, they're banded together, they're still going to be defeated. Right. Because at the after the end of the millennial reign of Christ, that's exactly what's going to happen. And you don't have to turn it. I'll just read for you from Revelation chapter twenty, verse seven. It says, "And when the thousand years are expired, that's with Jesus reigning on this earth, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Satan's going to come out of hell, it says, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number of whom is as the sand of the sea." And they went up on the breadth of the, of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. So Satan goes out. He deceives the rest of the world at that time. Jesus Christ has reigned for a thousand years on this earth. And things are way different at this point on the, you know, when, when Jesus is ruling and reigning. And it's after the wrath of God is poured out and everything else. Jesus' kingdom is, is, is set up. But there's still people that are unbelievers. There's still people who are unsaved throughout this thousand years. Satan is loosed out of his prison. He comes out and he deceives them. And he deceives so many of them, it says that they're like the sand by the sea. I mean, that's an innumerable multitude. Satan brings all these people out and they surround the camp of the Lord, right? The, 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 the saved, righteous people <laughs> surrounds them all. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. And what happens is when they surround, they compass the camp of the saints. It says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Saints didn't even have to fight. No reason to be worried, even for a second, even though you're surrounded by all of the unbelievers of the world with Satan leading the charge. Just gone, devoured in a second. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan's getting what's coming to him just as all the wicked are. Proverbs 11, let's keep reading here, verse number 22. Verse 22, As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. This is a great verse. To remember, it kind of stands out in your mind anyways. It's a real cool verse there about a, you know, the, the, a pig's nose. A jewel of gold in a, in a pig's nose. That is the picture that is painted 
referring to a woman, a fair woman, a beautiful woman, right? Someone, a woman who's, who's real beautiful to look on on the outside, but is without discretion. A woman has no discretion. It's like looking at a pig. Oh, yeah, but they're really beautiful. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a, a gold piece of jewelry in the pig's nose. That's how much her beauty is worth. And that should show to you, men, if you're looking for a wife, how much beauty should really, the outward beauty should matter. I mean, do you want to marry a pig? But she's got this great, you know, piece of jewelry in her nose. She's got this cool nose ring. Yeah, I don't want to marry a pig. <laughs> and what is discretion? It's being able to judge or to discern, for one. That's, that's part of the definition. It's also being discreet. right? Being able to know when to speak. Having tact. Knowing what's right and what's wrong and, and following through on that. And not being embarrassing. right? Someone, someone who, doesn't have, who lacks discretion is often an embarrassment. They go out and just whatever. You know, uh, I think of it's, it's also not being modest, right? When, you, when a woman lacks discretion. Oftentimes, I mean, what comes to my mind is, someone, is, is a woman who's, you know, you, it would be indiscreet to go, and I've used this example before, like to be wearing your bikini and go out to the store or to come to church or to go to somewhere else where it's like, that is showing no discretion at all. It's a shame. It is bringing, you know, um, it's embarrassing. What, the, the behavior is embarrassing. But that's someone who just has no discretion, doesn't know what, you know, what is uh, proper based on the situation you're in. And, and it reminds me also of 1 Peter chapter 3. You could stay in Proverbs 11. We're, we're almost done. 1 Peter 3, 4 says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart. This is referring to a woman. In that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The value, when you're looking at the characteristics of a, of a woman, it says, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, that is very valuable. That is something to be um, looked for in a godly woman. And you could read all of 1 Peter 3. There's a lot of other attributes and there's a lot of good things to be learned there. And it refers to uh, Sarah, Abraham's wife, being a good example of, of, of women and being obedient to your husbands, all these other things. But this particular verse, a jewel of gold and a swine's snout, talking about a fair woman that doesn't have discretion. Well, in God's eyes, the, the, the ornament, if you will, the jewel that is of great value is the meek and the quiet spirit. And that would be someone who does have discretion when they're meek and they're quiet. But let's keep reading here, verse uh, 23. There's a lot more. I kind of want to go into that, but let's, uh, let's try to get through the rest of this chapter tonight. Verse 23, The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than his meat, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. Now these four verses all go together very well. This is teaching us to be generous, not to hoard things to yourself. That's why it says in... Um, Turn, if you would, real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's the last place we'll turn besides Proverbs. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That's why it's saying there is that scattereth, somewhat someone who, who scatters, who is distributing. That's what scattering is, right? You're distributing what you have. You're throwing it out there. It says, yet increaseth. And you think, well, how does that make sense? How can I keep scattering but continue to increase? Right? And it says, and there is that withholdeth more than his meat. So they're holding it in themselves more than they need. They're, 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 they're piling in and piling in even more than they need. And it says, but it tendeth to poverty. So they're saying, you know, here's someone who goes out and scatters and they're willing to give and they have a free heart to just give, give, give. You know, they're doing great. And yet they're continuing to increase. But then this other person, you know, they're, they're keeping it all for themselves. They're keeping way more than they need. Yet they're the ones coming to poverty. 
Right. It's a principle being taught here. The liberal soul, and look, this is the good liberal. All right, not, not the political liberal that we hear about today. This is the good, because being liberal is, is giving liberty. It's, 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 it's being free, right? And when you're free with things, you know, liberal itself is a great word. It's kind of been bastardized today, but the reason why the left politically is called liberal is because they're more free with things that we would consider to be sin, Right, they're real socially free and just you know okay with everything, and that's that's kind of where that term has been pegged. But I don't want to get into that tonight because we're going to look at the 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 good liberal here because we shouldn't just be free with 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 how sinful you are. Right, that's that's not a good liberality to have. It says here though, the liberal soul shall be made fat. So someone who's free with their things, you know, open to, to giving unto people that ask of you. It says, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. When you are doing good to others and when you are helping other people out, hey, God sees that and you know what? He's going to bring that back on yourself. He's going to do good to you for doing that unto others. And it says, he that withholdeth the corn, the people shall curse him. You know, you're holding it all in for yourself. Don't be stingy. Don't think that you just have to hold on to everything that you have instead of giving to other people. And it, rely, it requires some kind of faith. It requires you to believe the Bible because, look, let's face it, I know a lot of people here aren't necessarily extremely stable and just have a lot of disposable income. You know, a lot of people you kind of keeping track on everything you got because you don't got that much. But the Bible is teaching us, you know what? You don't have to be that strict with holding on everything you have. Be a little bit freer with it. Be more liberal with it and just trust God knowing that, first of all, you don't want your heart being so attached to the, to the finances, to the, to, the, to the physical things that you have that you just have to protect them so much because they're going to be here and gone anyways. Treat them for what they are appropriately. Do we need money to survive? Yes, we do. Do I need to provide for my family? Of course I do. But does the money really matter? No, it doesn't. You know why? Because God has already promised that he's going to take care of us. He's going to feed us and he's going to clothe us. And with such things, we should just be content. So if we could help someone else out with a little bit that we have, then amen. That's good. And you ought to be able to just be generous with that as opposed to being stingy. Luke 6.38, you're in 2 Corinthians 9, stay there. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Those words stand out to me. He's saying, you know, when you give, it's going to be given to you, but it's going to be a good measure. So when you give, what you get back, it's going to be really good because it's going to be pressed down. Right, and you think about, about a lot of things that you weigh, and um, I know we have grains and things like that, that they settle, right? But if you're getting something measured out, and you're saying, okay, well, we're going to fill it up to here, and that's it. He's saying, no, we're going to press it down and make sure we can fit as much as possible in here, that you are getting the best measure possible. Same thing with shaking together, because that's one of the ways to get those, the, the grains is up to settle. You shake it, shake it, shake it, and it goes down and down and down. Shaking together and running over. You get the heaping scoops just, just running over back to you when you are generous, when you give. He says, and it says, uh, Press down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And he's saying, you know, you should be like that. When you're, being, you know, when you're willing to give to people like that, hey, it'll come back to you. You don't have to worry about it. But see, ultimately, we don't have to worry about these things. You say, I got to, you know, this brother's really in need, and, and, and I don't have that much. But if they're really in need, hey, be generous with them. Help them out. Help them in their time of need. You don't have to just hold on to every last penny. Right? Or whatever the case may be. 2 Corinthians 9, look at verse number 6. The Bible reads, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And this whole context in 2 Corinthians 9 is when they're putting money aside for other saints. And I preached on this before recently too. But um, he's saying when you sow, and that's what he's referring to sowing here. 
it's an it's analogy saying, you know, sowing, when you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. So if you have, you know, seeds that you want to plant in the ground, well, if you don't plant very many, you can't expect to get very much back. But the more that you throw out there, then, yeah, you're going to get more back. And this is, he was referring to the um, helping out the saints in, in another church, in another area, people who were in need at that time. But let's keep reading here, verse 7. It says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. So again, don't let this teaching make you think that you're forced into giving. This is not a forced giving. When you help people out, when someone's in need and you decide from your heart to help that person out, you are not required to do that. You are not under some form of God's law to do this. These are all principles that the Bible's teaching us. Hey, if you give, it's going to come back to you. God's going to make sure that your recompense for the good things that you do, it'll come back to you again. So you could, you could believe that and trust in that, but it's not like you have to do those things because God doesn't want you to feel like you're giving of necessity. And so it says, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. You ought to be happy to help people out. And that's why you don't give because you feel like you just absolutely have to and you're sinning if you don't. Now, in the context, I just want to point this out, this is referring to the giving of alms. This would be like a free will offering of helping somebody else in need out. This is not talking about the tithe because the tithe belongs to God. I've heard people, you know, preachers try to say, oh yeah, see the Bible says right here, you don't give of necessity. Well, when you pay your tithe to God, that's, that's God's. That's that, so that is of necessity. In context here, and go ahead and read it for yourself later. 2 Corinthians 9. Read the whole thing and see what it's talking about. What is he referring to? Where is this going? And you'll see that it's to, to the other saints that were in need from a whole other church, not even in their local church. They're sending it off to other people in need. Like we are sending money off to missionaries. There is no biblical requirement that says you have to give money to support missionaries. You don't have to do it. But he's saying, you know what? If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You know, you can't expect to get much back from these guys if you're not helping them out. Verse number eight says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Verse, jump down to verse number 12. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorified God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men and by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. So there again, it's talking about the liberal distribution unto the saints. Now, we ought to be hospitable when, you know, when brethren come and visit and, um, you know, people come, when, especially when you invite people to your home, you know, take care of them, feed them. This is something that, again, I think in, in this generation, it's, it, there's, a lot, there's a lot of principles, there's a lot of basics that have just been thrown out the window. There's a, there's a lot of just the, the, I mean, to me, it's common sense, but it's part of just how I was raised. And this is something that I didn't even have to be taught. It's something that I saw and learned. It is something I had, no, I'll take that back. It is something I had to be taught. It's not something I had to be spelled out to me. Right. You know, like, this is what you do when, when, you have, when we have guests over. This is how we treat them. My mother and my father never told me that. But I saw the way that they treated other people. When we had guests in our house, they were the servants. They would sit them down in the best place. They would give them the best food. They would do whatever it is for them. That's how you treat someone, and that's how you're hospitable towards them. And that's being generous and being having a you know, liberal distribution unto them and being able to treat people like that. And so when we have visitors that come in here, you know, we ought to be able to do the same things. We ought to be, 
be generous and helpful. And I appreciate everyone that has been helpful up to this point. You know, we've had, we've had people in church offer up their house and their place to stay. You know, when people come up and visit and say, hey, you know what, just let us know. And that is extremely much appreciated. And thank you for that. And I think that's the way that we ought to be as a church, as people of God. You know, it, it, it will come back to you. So we don't have to worry about you know, be so stuck on how much money you're spending or whatever, you know, if you can help people out and they have a need, then, then you know what? Don't worry about it. Just have the faith that it'll come back to you. There are great promises that God will recompense you for taking care of other people generously. Uh, let's finish off the chapter here. Verse, um, yeah, verse number 27. Proverbs eleven twenty-seven. 27. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And that is an entire sermon in and of itself, but take that to heart. The Bible's talking about... The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. The righteous ought to be bringing forth other trees of life, not just other fruit. The fruit of the righteous, what you bring forth, ought to be trees. Because what do trees do? They bring forth fruit. So the main goal here, it says, and he that winneth souls is wise to let you just, just to bring that all into context to help you understand what it's talking about here. When you go out and win souls, when we go out and win souls, when we preach the gospel of Christ, yes, we're going out to, to win people to Christ and bring forth that fruit of someone else believing on the Lord. But ultimately, what we really want to do is not only bring them forth unto Christ, but then disciple them, get them baptized, and teach and train them to be a tree to bring other people to Christ also. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, bringing forth another tree that also brings forth fruit. That is the ultimate goal, and we ought to keep that in mind and keep that in the vision when we go out soul winning that it's not, I mean, yes, focus on getting the person saved, but don't stop there. It's easy to stop there. It's easy to say, hey, praise the Lord and get excited because the soul got saved, and I'm not saying don't get excited for it, but don't let that then just be like, okay, we're going home now. At least even in your mind, right? Say, this person now needs to grow. This is a baby. Let's, let's do, you know, see what we can do. And now I know not with, with everybody you can't, and they won't even let you, you know, help them out. But we ought to be going out with the vision, with the mindset that we're going to try our best to help these people out and do what we can. Hey, if they refuse, it's up to them. If they don't want to come to church, you know, ultimately it's going to be up to them. But we need to be making the effort to bring these people and to help and to guide them to the best that we can. And that's going to include when you're done, if you lead someone to Christ, try to get some contact information to them. Ask them if it's okay. Hey, can I call you? Can I speak with you? And honestly, we need to do this individually because I will not be able to get all of this done. Like if you just bring me all the information... There's no way I'm going to get all that done. We need to take that out individually responsible for you know, all the people we talk to. And besides, you're the one that had that great experience with that person of leading them to Christ. It's much more personal for them to be hearing from you and someone that, 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 that you know, is obviously caring about them. Not that I wouldn't, but it's much more impersonal than to be contacted by the pastor. Now, I'm willing to do it, and I have done it, and I will continue to do it for people that, that you know, come in, especially people who come in and visit, and then they're gone. You know, I'll follow through with those people, but you're going to have a lot better results when you could do it yourself. And you could have the fruit of the righteous and bring forth that tree of life. And then that last verse there, uh, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. We don't get away with anything, but the righteous, at least if you're saved, you know, hey, we're going to be recompensed in this earth. But the wicked and the sinner, way more. It says much more. Praise God for His mercy. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer.
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom, dear Lord. There's so much to learn, dear God. I pray that you would please um, continue to show us the way, dear God. Lighten up the path. Lord, help us not to be um, confused or confounded by the world and this world's philosophies, dear Lord, but that we can accept what's clearly written in your word and, and understand how they apply to us today, dear Lord. Um, even when we're looking at Old Testament, New Testament, whatever the scripture is, dear Lord, that we could understand the proper application in our life and, and how we ought to live. Because what we want to do, dear Lord, is to be righteous in your eyes and in the sight of men, dear Lord, both. But primarily in your eyes that we could be doing as much as possible to serve you and to bring honor and glory unto the name of your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.